Kozlowski and welcome to Downline TV, where I'm co-hosting alongside Sarah Stone. In today's episode, we have two fantastic coaches who do such a brilliant job in our coaching community, Louise Plumbing and Michael Legazzo. Today's episode, we'll be discussing relationship building and challenges facing female players. Stoney, absolute ripper of a guest today. They've all been amazing, but this in particular individual is one of my favourite people in tennis. She's not only entertaining, never a dull moment, but an awesome human being and wears so many different hats in the tennis circles. Welcome, Louise Plumbing. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. Great guys, stuff. Thank, thank you for being on the show. Uh, what are you up to? Saturday afternoon. It's uh, pretty overcast here in Melbourne. What, what are your weekend looking like? Oh, well, just went for a little walk along uh, Bondi Beach. We're so lucky, actually, to be in Sydney. Um, we don't have the lockdowns that other people around the country and around the world have. So, yeah, we got to see some beautiful ocean. There were some whales out there. And, um, yeah, just relaxing today. It's been a big week. It's been a very big week. Oh, amazing. Yeah, Lou, Boo said that you wear a lot of hats, which you do. We've heard from quite a few of the girls who say that Louise Fleming sets the culture for Australian tennis with inclusion and making everyone feel welcome, which is an amazing yeah. thing to be able to contribute to tennis. But alongside that, you've got a huge project you're on to, Rally Forever. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, uh, I have absolutely loved uh, my life in tennis. I've been given so many opportunities and I probably never thought I would get this opportunity uh, that I'm in today, which is uh, really reaching out to the homeless and, and people who are disadvantaged, um, trying to kind of bring a little bit of love and, and happiness through tennis and exercise into their lives. And um, yeah, so it's, it's been a project that's kind of, I fell into three and a half years ago. I, I met a homeless guy, Brian, and we started tennis coaching. And um, the day I kind of hit with him that first day, he just wouldn't let me go. And I had to keep doing it every, pretty much every day or any day that <laughs> I was available in Sydney. He's like, Lou, when can we play tennis? But um, no, it was, it's, it's been amazing because just to see the change in him and how much you can impact somebody's life, uh, that's incredibly powerful. Where'd you actually yeah. meet him? Yeah. Um, I was doing a little bit of volunteering work at St. Canis. It's a homeless kitchen in the city where, or in Kings Cross, one of the disadvantaged areas here in Sydney. And um, he just came up to me one day and he goes, I know who you are and I've seen you commentate. <laughs> and when are you going to play tennis with me? And I thought, well, what's the yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was hilarious actually, because he said, come and, come and sit down and have a coffee with me after. So we'd finished serving and I went and sat down with Brian and he, he said, have a look at this. This was my first moment with Brian. He was carrying a little black bag and he opened up the zip like this and opened it up and inside was two beautiful, um, what were they like, R2000 Jimmy Connors. Oh, the ones with the wire around the sides. Yeah, yeah, from like 30 years ago, they're in beautiful kind of shape and he had three little tennis balls and he said, come and play tennis with me. And I said, with how could I not? Um, oh. and, and four days later, um, he said, Monday morning, six o'clock, meet me at the courts. And I said, six o'clock's a bit early. And I said, listen, <laughs> give, me your, give me your telephone number. We'll have a chat over the weekend and we'll set it up. And he goes, I'm homeless. I live under a tree near the park and I don't have a phone. So I'll see you at seven o'clock Monday morning at the tennis <laughs> Incredible. Well, I think, I mean, how incredible. I mean, most people, Lou, I don't think would probably stop. And just for you to be able to give up your, your time, which I don't feel like you probably feel like you're giving it up, but you're providing so many opportunities for these people. And I know you've got some incredible ambassadors behind you. Um, you know, you've got Pip Edwards from PE Nation, who's been a part of it, and Michael Clark, the Australian cricket captain, and yeah, Michael Caton, which I, I've been really enjoying following. He's, he's entertaining and um, has made you want to get into it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see him jumping around down at the beach just saying, <laughs> go and yeah. do a virtual class? He, he's yeah. been amazing. And I think all these people, yeah, they know the impact of, um, I guess, COVID-19, but also just mental health is, is a very big issue. And it's only going to become uh, probably more of an issue with what we've been feeling lately. So, yeah, I, I feel blessed that there's really nice people that have followed the journey with us. Oh, fantastic. You got some great names there, as Betty said. What does the program actually look like? Like, what do you? You're obviously playing with some homeless people, but is it a formal structure? Yeah, well, we're looking to really formalise it. That's the thing. We've only just kind of incorporated. We're now a um, not-for-profit company. Oh, great. We'll, 
become, you know, a charity so we can take some people, if, if anyone wants to give some money to then create more opportunities. But at the moment, we are running um, like a tennis uh, group kind of lesson down at Rushcutters Bay. So last week we had seven guys from kind of the Housing Commission area in Woolloomooloo. They all came along. They all got to meet each other. I had Jess Moore, uh, obviously a really loved Australian pro. She's helping us out. Um, and also Alex Osborne, she's a, a new player on the tour. Yeah. They all came and they're all sharing their time as well. So we got to coach these seven individuals. They had an act, absolute ball. Um, and they're all people that didn't know each other. So in a small community where they're trying to actually create a bit of a friendship group as well, um, it, it was fantastic. So we're running that group and we're looking to then reach out to other clubs and actually other clubs are coming to us and saying, we'd love to do one in Camperdown. Um, Sydney City Management Group have come to us. They're with the council and they've got clubs and they're saying, we want to collaborate with you. So we've got people coming on board and it's just growing exponentially. As soon as we have chats like this, I was lucky I was on Kyle and Jackie O the other morning. It's a great radio station here after that. I had people, you know, coaches and, and um, fitness trainers just saying, hey, how can we join in and how can we become a volunteer? So um, it's just going to grow, Sarah. It's at the very beginning grassroots level and just with every kind of bit of energy that we're feeling and all these people coming on board, we're, we're going to grow pretty quickly and we want to get to as many areas as we can, certainly disadvantaged areas, um, where we can impact a greater group and, and really feel like we're making a difference. What we're also doing is we're reaching out, we're doing some viral classes. We've got Alex, this amazing fitness trainer. So alongside tennis coaching, we're also looking out to, you know, there's a few people on the planet that don't really play tennis or haven't played tennis that would love to get into fitness. We don't want to leave them out. So we started running some fitness classes for the homeless as well at St. Canis and they love that. And again, just seeing how people's body image and how they're, you know, how they changed and how they just felt so much better about themselves, just knowing there was something that they could connect to and it was, um, yeah, something they loved. So, we're, yeah, we're also doing some viral fitness classes for everyone who's in isolation at the moment. All these people down in Melbourne and everyone around that can reach out to us on uh, Rally Forever um, AUS on Instagram we're running viral classes. So we're gonna do a yoga class with Pip Edwards and our amazing trainer, Alex, on Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. So it'd be great if you know people joined us. And um, yeah, that's, that's just what we're doing. It, it's a little part for the community at the moment, but we hope it really grows. Yeah, and Lou, I need to let you know that, um, so one of the mornings that the yoga session was happening, I uh, got myself into a bit of a situation where I was obviously got a fusion in my L5S1 and um, I was okay getting into that position, but getting out of that position, I needed to call almost triple zero. So thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Of course you did. Take it easy. How, how is your back? You're getting a little bit more oh, mobile? Well, after that, I, I just felt so much more limber. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So it's, uh, it's virtual now. And then when we're out of COVID, eventually Melbourne will join the rest of the country. Are you looking to have programs at different facilities or how's that going to work? Yes, absolutely. Well, as we start doing some fundraising, we get more, um, you know, financially viable. Then we want to set up clubs all around Australia where we can then link to really good mental health services and homeless services. So we can have a club. So we have a club in Parramatta. We reach out to services in that area, which could be Black Dog, could be Beyond Blue, could be other mental health services. We say, can you bring, we've got eight spots, let's fill it and give these people a real lift in their life. And so that's how we're going to almost become like a service provider. Um, oh, that's great. So yeah. along with having volunteers, we'll then also become a real... Um, yeah, we'll get funding and then we'll be able to really contribute back into the community, pay for coaches, pay for fitness trainers and just really work that circular economy. Amazing, Lou. I honestly love it. And, you know, Lou, I want to I want to talk about the contribution you've made to tennis, um, you know, not only in Australia, but, you know, you're such a well-known face around the tennis industry and you've got, like I said, you've worn so many hats, but we spoke to Alana Parnaby, spoke so highly of you, and so many of the girls do. You've played such a pivotal role in their careers, and you're always there. You're always that coach on the court all day, looking after, you know, six or seven players at once, and, you know, you're incredible. 
I guess, in your mind, what, what do you feel like you've been able to contribute to those girls over the years? I think, firstly, I feel really lucky. Um, Nicole Pratt, who's been the head of our program, has really seen a value add in, in really trying to put um, a real emphasis on bringing all the girls together. It's an individual sport and it can be a very, very lonely sport, tennis at times. So really connecting with all those girls that weren't getting a lot of support, weren't getting a lot of Tennis Australia support, we could bring them all together and make them feel a lot more loved. And, and certainly just making sure that their mental health is, was very strong and buoyant and that, you know, we could impact them every day and make sure they felt really cared for. So I felt really lucky that that was a big part of the way uh, Nicole and Tennis Australia wanted to embrace those young girls. Um, for me, I, I, I love tennis so much and it's brought so much to me. And, and I guess, um, you know, as much as you want to see young people become better tennis players, I wanted to see them really grow as individuals and, and to be happier, like a happier workplace for them. They're going to certainly um, achieve their results so much better. And, you know, just to spread that kind of influence around to everyone rather than people feeling down and isolated and not really valued, to everyone feel like they're worthwhile and that they're impacting um, the tennis circuit, they can become the best that they can and just a little bit of that love. It, it's incredible how much a bit of nurturing can really help. Yeah, oh, for sure, Lou, for sure. We've seen it. <laughs> you know, spending so much time with you, we've seen it around the grounds and the girls definitely feel it. So I just wanted you to know that Alana did say some, some fantastic words and she's not the only one. No, oh, and I think, and you sure do the is. same. You do the same job. We've worked very much side by side. So, you know, I think what I love about Tennis Australia, you know, three or four years ago, there was a real priority to bring female coaches into the system, and we're very lucky. And I know Sarah, you're a big advocate for for women in sport and and women coaches, and and it's incredibly empowering that we do have that voice and that we are able to to just link to their feelings and to be able to really tap in and know what, what they're going through. It's, um, it's very important to have that in any organisation. Staying with the coaching for a minute, Lou, you have worn, as we've said, many hats. You've been a top WTA player yourself. You've been a coach or Grand Slam champion. You've worked with players all the way down through the ITF and WTA tours. Your experience is huge. What is it that makes a great coach? We want to get more women coaches into the sport, but if we can have some clarity around what should coaches be trying to put forward to connect with players, what does it look like? Yeah, look, I think there's a couple of things that are really important. I think it's um, to be very, um, very clear with the character and the person that you're working with, really understand uh, who they are and not try to change them as individuals. Um, there are so many different kind of players, player styles, um, just, you know, different people out there and you have to really understand that and link in to their personalities. So I think for me, I'm a talker. I, I find it very hard to, to shut up basically. So for me, <laughs> so for me that, so that's the hardest thing. Yeah, I think we all find that when we're very much people person. I think the number one thing is to listen. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to really go on that journey with them and to feel what they're feeling and then to really guide them. So the biggest, the biggest lesson, I guess, that I learned was to be a better listener um, and just to really have that care factor. I think you can fix somebody's forehand and their backhand if they're dying inside and, you know, they're not a happy individual and they can't understand, they, ca they can't really understand that journey. Um, yeah you know, and take that little bit of pressure away from them and just bring it back down to their sole purpose, what they really want to get out of the game, I think you can then really start to impact them. Yeah. And Lou, you know, like Sarah said, obviously we'd love to get more females in the sport coaching. Um, a lot of the conversations uh, I've had, and I'm, I'm sure whether you, whether you guys have had the same conversation, but a lot of the time, a lot of females have some great information and it can be great coaches. Yeah don't have the confidence to put their step forward and, and the word high performance seems to scare a lot of these coaches. How do we, how do we bring them on that journey? Yeah, I think you, I, I don't care really where you start on that journey. You never know everything. And, and I think that's what we need to really put out there that the journey is long. Um, we all work shoulder to shoulder. We all want to give information. We want to help everybody. And that, 
I've been helped so many times along my journey and um, I've had great role models. I've had, you know, really good people lift me up on my days when I didn't really understand how to get through to a player. And you don't always, you don't always feel like you can impact a player. Sometimes the, the message or that little um, red flag or whatever it is, just the light bulb goes off along the journey. And I think you never do anything if you feel like you have to have all the information before you start. Yeah. So I think just just get out there and be passionate um, and just kind of connect with your player and bring whatever you can today and, and be so open and enthusiastic to learn. I think that's really important. Just get rid of that fear um, and to honestly know that no one knows everything. <laughs> and, you never, and you never always get it right. No, wow, that's for sure. <laughs> One of the things Alana said was she recalled a match that she was going into, I believe, and she was really struggling and you managed to pep her up and give us, instill some confidence in her. What are the differences for coaches working with different levels of players between what, sitting with a player before they're about to go out and play a Grand Slam final or you're sitting with a player who's ranked 900 in the world and they're about to go out and play a match that's the first time they've ever qualified for a challenger. Are the players going through distinctly different things or is it much the same at any level of competition? Yeah, strangely enough, there's a lot of similarities, aren't there? And it's just bringing it back to what you know, just staying in the moment, just you've been out here so many days, we've worked on the same things, just building that confidence, getting them to understand they have all the knowledge they are, you know, it, it's a journey. Take away the emotion and just really go back to the process. And I know that's a word that's thrown around the tennis industry forever, which is just stick to the processes. But we have to stay true to ourselves. You know what, you know, you've been working on and, and you just have to trust that in that moment. Um, and then have those tools where the biggest thing that holds everyone back is, is nerves, anxiety. It doesn't matter if you're playing your first match in an ATM or whether you're playing um, an, a an AMT, sorry, not an ATM. Um, <laughs> we know what you're saying. That's a cash teller after you win it. But, um, <laughs> exactly. Only, first round. <laughs> exactly. Or whether you're playing in a Grand Slam tournament, it's just really understanding that everyone's going to feel a little bit of emotion and you have to take that out. And how do we kind of go through those things that, you know, you've been working on, whether it's breathing, whether it's, you know, just going through those tactical things that you've worked on, where you want to serve, where your next shot is, just being very clear, not making it complicated and um, yeah. yeah, just just reinforcing that they're ready for it and no matter what and don't think about the result, just stay in the present is probably the biggest one. Was yeah. it the same for you as a player when you were playing on tour? Did you have a process that you went through before you went out to play matches? Not really. I think it was all a learning curve for me. I mean, I grew up on a farm um, in Wagga Wagga and I didn't have a lot of informed kind of early on coaching. I learned so many of the messages and lessons along the way. Um, you know, so it was just falling over, making mistakes, getting yourself, picking yourself back up. And I think that's probably why I am a decent coach because I, I had to learn the hard way. And I think when you learn the hard, when you learn the hard way, I should say, um, it tends to stick a little bit more, you know? I think the lessons when they hurt, um, yeah, it tends to stay. When, sometimes when you get told the same message over and over, it, it takes a little bit longer to absorb. So um, for me, yeah, I had to learn the hard way and, and that's why I think I'm really passionate. Not to allow some of the players to get themselves into the same kind of situations. I did, a lot of it was off court stuff, learning how to, you know, be ready for your match, how to focus, how to prepare, um, all of those things. You know, when I was young, I probably felt like I was, I never had a really good plan. Um, and I think that's important, how to periodize and how to, um, you know, just, just know where you're going, what the journey looks like, and just take your time. Don't feel like you're in this rush to achieve. It takes time. Um, and just to put really good people around you that are honest and, and that you have that level of trust. Um, There's a lot of really great messages in that, Lou. And I know 
again, it's um, it's very relatable to the, all the players that you've definitely spent time with. And Lou, I want to paint the picture for Sarah because I've spent so much time with you in the past, but you're the coach that has got the biggest following when it comes to doing yoga in the morning at like seven o'clock or whatever it is. And I think you've literally got everybody um, on it at, at this stage. I don't know how many members have you got of the Louise Fleming group at this stage? <laughs> yeah, look, that, that is true. That's one thing that I've really learned. Even, it's funny, like I talk to Martina Navratilo over these days and Martina goes out and does yoga pretty much every day. And when I see her, we do yoga together. And she just said to me, you know, if I had have learnt yoga when I was younger and I knew how to do this when I played, I would have been calmer, more yeah. focused and just, you know, more relaxed, more flexible um, and just certainly more centred. And I think yoga, like it's something, it takes a little bit of time to really feel like you're getting it. And it yeah. took me forever. I would have rather jump around walls and go for like, you know, 10 minute sprints and burn energy back then. But today you realise the, the value of just being a little bit calmer and a bit centred. I would have, yeah, I would have learned so much. So I really think it's fantastic to give to all the girls now. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I don't know, but I feel like today with social media and all the pressures that these young girls have, it, it's a different landscape as well. I don't know mm -hmm. for you guys. Oh, for it's sure. It's world out there on the tour now. Oh, yeah. uh, definitely. Nails. <laughs> You can't even relate to it as a player. So, I mean, Stoney, I had one of the worst, I think the oldest mobile phone when, uh, you know, when I was playing and I think I just learned how to start texting when I was like, you had a phone? I, so, I nearly had to have a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> I got one at 15, I think. I was still writing pen pal letters at that point, to be honest. <laughs> well, I nearly sent a telegram. I'll be writing <laughs> <laughs> um, Lou, I, I wanted to speak to that, you know, you spent a lot of time in commentary as well. Um, I believe it was BBC, was it? Or who were you? Everywhere. First, I think ABC and Hotman Cup were probably the first people that gave me an opportunity, which was great. So I cut my teeth with them. Um, I think uh, Paul McNamee told me I was pretty average the first few times and I went, I knew right. Macca. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like, just learning, you've got to learn the craft and you don't get much help in, um, in learning a new kind of craft, particularly in broadcasting. You've got to go out there and yeah, you just go for it. But yeah, I've been lucky enough. I've worked at every Grand Slam and I work with some great networks now around the world. And um, yeah, it's pretty great to sit there and watch all the amazing top 10 players and the lower ranked players, the young kids coming through. So you can really get to see the trends and see things that are happening. And, and yeah, then I get to take it back at the lower levels and work in the high performance space with Tennis Australia and give that knowledge back, which, yeah, is invaluable. Certainly, I'm sure that you've, through your coaching and through your commentary and you get to see so much great tennis. Have you expanded a lot as a, your tennis IQ, I guess? Absolutely, for sure. Like it, it it's, um, it's incredible, I think, as a past player. And then now you get so frustrated. You think, if I only knew that yeah. back then, you <laughs> listen there and go, gosh, what I didn't know. But you learn so much from the great players and just the way they walk and talk and act on the court and watch them training and to watch the Federers, the, the Hallocks, the Nadals, the people that just are, yeah, they're just so conditioned with the way they go about their play but they're such great individuals as well how they behave on their court so disciplined um and yet they just have such a love for the sport as well um i guess that's the real connection isn't it if you mm. want to stay out here and have that longevity you have to find a way there's got to be a connection with the sport that drives you that keeps you here um and it and it's if we can impart that and connect and give them that knowledge and, and, and connect that a little bit, then we've done our job if they love the game that little bit more. Yeah, for sure, Lou. And I guess in, from all the comments, like I remember speaking to you in January, you'd just been commentating at the Australian Open. And I guess where do you see the game heading in the women's game anyway? Where do you see it? How much better can it get? Where do you see the big improvements being made? Yeah, look, I, I think there's a few different trends that are certainly coming through the sport. But um, if you're six foot two and you have a massive serve like Serena Williams and you've got an unbelievable first shot, and we talk about a big serve in our first shot. And, you know, if you have that, which I see the game very much going 
towards, you know, it's, um, it's very much a power play. But then you do have, you know, you've got your Ash Barty's, the transitional players, all court players that are just fantastic to watch. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think we'll see a little bit of a shift going back towards that. Um, yeah. So that that's great to see. And then you've got, you know, still you've got your Hallops that are just so tough mentally mm. and physically incredibly, incredibly good. Won't miss a ball. So hungry to move and run and, and hit down a million balls. So, you know, again, it's understanding your strengths. Are you six foot two or are you built like a pocket rocket? Um, and then you have to really, I guess, trend your game around your kind of physical attributes as well. Um, which again, if, if we can really see those three strands of game, game styles staying in the game, it brings that little bit more fun to the game. We don't want everyone to be an Amazon and to have, you know, these short points and it will be a bit boring. So the more Ash Barty's we see out there, then fantastic. So rules, rules me out for making a comeback, five foot uh, two. I could put you on a ladder, boo, then you'd be all right. <laughs> Lou, how do we get more female coaches into the game? It's, it's a question everybody talks about. There's not enough, there's not enough. What are some of the solutions and what advice would you have for young females looking to get into coaching at the top level? Yeah, I think we've got to reach out to them, don't we? And we have to educate them a little bit more. Like we have to embrace them and really encourage them to, to feel that they are equals. And I mm -hmm. think one of, the things, one of the things that holds female coaches back is the physical ability. Um, so, you know, you see a lot of uh, female tennis players out there and they're not backing female coaches because they're so driven about getting a good hitting coach. So I want a, a male yeah. coach who yeah. can hit balls back. Well, firstly, not all guys play the same kind of ball that a, that a female player plays. So it's a different ball coming back at you. And also, you're not being put in the same pressure as well, just practicing with guys all the time. So women bring a different kind of influence and a different pressure. But what women bring to the sport is the mental side mm -hmm. so much more. That connection with our, you know, what's inside here is sometimes 10 times more powerful than having a big, hard, strong ball coming back at you. So it's that that connection between who we are um, and our DNA, what we're made of. I tell you, at the very top of the game, we've seen incredible players breaking down over time. Um, yeah. Kerber, sad to see her rise to the game and mm -hmm. then really, you know, struggled mentally. And many of the players that are, are out there that achieve greatness, um, Gabinia Muguruza winning a Grand Slam and then not being able to maintain and then moving to a female coach, Conchita mm -hmm. Martinez. That mm -hmm. is going to influence her in such a different way and give her that real sense of, of power and strength and connection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think if we can share that with more young female players and get them to understand they bring something completely different to the game and not try to compare, I think we have to go away from that, you know, but to really outline the value and, and the things that females bring and it's immeasurably, incredibly powerful. Yeah, and I, yeah, well, Lou, look, we're running out of time, but we want to say thank you, great insights. We'll Thanks, definitely Lou. be sharing that message because that's, uh, yeah, some great insight there into some of the young female coaches, but also what you're doing and, you know, it's Rally Forever, so it's the number four, uh, Ever AUS, so uh, get on it. Facebook, Instagram, a whole lot. Join some yoga. Thanks for joining us, Lou. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And you guys are Thanks, right Lou. there with us. We're all in this together, as they <laughs> always say. But keep the female power going. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Welcome to Down the Line TV, Michael Lagazzo. Hey, Betty. How are you, Sarah? Thanks for having me. Hey, Mike. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, Mike. I know we're uh, in a bit of a lockdown here in Melbourne, so this is a great way to spend a rainy afternoon. Well, to ask you, in, uh, what have you been doing lately over this period? How have you been you know, using up your time? Yeah, it's been an interesting period, um, not being able to go on court, but I've actually spent a lot of it doing uh, online stuff, doing a lot of learning and just creating programs for the players. 
and just researching, looking at a lot, whole heap of different things and just a lot of planning stuff. I mean, you can, you do what you can. Um, got so much information that I realized that I haven't looked at for so long that I've actually gone, well, I need to put this stuff together. So I've been spending a lot of time with that, but pretty keen to get back on, on the court. Mike, one of the big things that you do is you build great relationships with your players. Talk to us a little bit about how you form those connections, the trust, and what goes into a coach building a relationship with their players. Yeah, I think the first thing to remember is that they're people first, and it's not just about the player. So it's really important that you get to know the person, um, even a bit of their background, and just try to connect with them on that level, rather than we can get so, so caught up as coaches with, you know, how to hit a forehand, how to hit a backhand, and, and the results that I think really important first step is to just get to know the player, get to know what they're like, get to know their goals, um, even dynamics within their family, um, which allow you as much information as possible to be able to you know, teach them the best way you can, both as a tennis player. But I thought, I think it's important as coaches that we're also developing the individual. You know, if they, yeah. they want to go to that next level that, you know, there's so many things they have to deal with, so many, you know, adaptations they, they have to go through going through the levels. So I think it's really important that we as coaches prepare for prepare them for that that as best we can. So I think yeah. getting to know the person first is is crucial. And Mike, uh, you know, we talk a lot about that, don't we? We talk a lot about uh, we have those conversations, you know, we adapt, we get to know the parents. Some coaches do it better than others. Uh, I know you do it really well. You're, you know, you've got your own coaching business called ML Tennis down at Parkdale. I know you coach a lot of our really, you know, talented young young kids coming up, and you've been coaching Zoe Hives for the past seven years. You've had Zoe for a very long time. You've seen the growth in her. I think she's reached the top of 140 in the world not long ago. Has uh, been plagued a little bit by injury, but how has that um, developed over time? What things have you implemented with Zoe over that seven year journey? Yeah, it's been a long journey, a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, for me as a coach also, a lot of learning and a lot of growth. So I look at it as a journey, between, not just for her, but for me as well. So as a team, we're growing together. I've always approached it that way. So if I remember back when we started, you know, Zoe almost quit tennis. So she was about 16, one of the top juniors, but just had had enough. And I think a lot of players don't lose the love for playing the game, but it's all the things that that go around um, the actual plane, the traveling, the pressures that they struggle to cope with and they're growing up as well. So for her, the biggest thing was, you know, we've got to get your enjoyment back. So I had to make sure she was enjoying it, but also try to understand what her goals were. Um, you know, as coaches, sometimes we look at it from a, a results based goal. What's the end goal ranking, you know, Grand Slam level winning tournaments, but every individual player has a different why as to, the reason they're playing. And we had to discover that with Zoe and it took a while. Um, Zoe's quite shy. So it's just trying to build up that trust over a period of time. So, you know, the way I communicated with her, um, allowing her to be herself again, trying to find her identity. Cause I think it was, it was crucial for her at, at this point of her career and, and her age, especially with so many things going on that she probably didn't have an, her own personal identity. It was tied to a tennis a little bit, which I think is very common. So it's it was finding that. And then gradually we just built on those, those foundations that we set. We set goals from the very start. So I always took a long-term approach as to how I wanted to, you know, how I saw the journey. Um, and it was, it was purely process orientated for her and, and, and understanding, I had to understand what it is that drove her and for her, it's improving. It's not results. It's not, you know, the glory and, and having all the adulation or anything like that. It was the process. It was going out every day learning. It was her trying to her trying to find herself as an individual. And for me, you know, I had to learn that as well. So it wasn't a case of, yeah, I walked in and I knew exactly what was going on. You know, I think it's important that we um, allow ourselves to fail as well and to learn. And I think with her, especially she's seen that it's been a growth journey for both of us. And that's how I've approached it with her and how I approach it with now all the players is, you know, I tell them I'm going to stuff up every lesson. I'm going to stuff up and they look at you like weird, but this is our journey. <laughs> together. We're growing together because they're all different. You know, Zoe was different to a lot of other players 
um, yeah. her peers, for example. So if I treated her exactly the same, then I probably wouldn't have got the results I did. So I had to make sure that, you know, I worked out what it is that she needed. And, and players will sort of tell you what they need, um, yeah. how they want to be communicated to, um, what drives them. It's, it's not what I think. It's, it's actually what they think. I'm there to serve her and, and figure out how I can best get that out of her. I think, yeah. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? So you like, we have a lot of, the kids these days aren't worried about sharing how they feel and what they like. I mean, you would have all experienced that with the generation coming up. They're all pretty confident and they generally like to tell you. If they don't like something, they'll tell you pretty quickly. So I think as coaches, we kind of grow with that, don't we? Yeah, it's very much athlete-centred, the way we need to approach our coaching, looking at what works for that athlete. And obviously, Mike, that's uh, right at the core of how you go about your business. You're widely known as the go-to guy, particularly in Victoria. When you've got a good kid, you send him to Mike. I know there's other go-to coaches. And that must come through the athlete-centred approach. People know that. For young coaches watching this, what kind of advice would you have for them when it comes to refining their coaching philosophy? Um, I think it's important to keep learning and not think you know everything. Um, I think as young coaches, it's really easy. You think you know a lot. And then what I've learned and the way I approach things is as you go on the journey, you're constantly learning, you're constantly growing, you're constantly evolving. And I don't think your philosophy is set in stone. It keeps moving, it keeps changing, you're learning different things. I actually think working with the players you work with actually assist you in developing that philosophy. So working with Zoe, for example, for as long as I have, I've learned how to better communicate. I've learned, you know, how I want to deal with with players and and you know, especially with the girls, you know, I you know, the first thing I would say to coaches is you've got to listen, you know, and boys and girls, but especially because you've got to listen to the player. Um, yeah, absolutely. Listen, listen, listen to the player and acknowledge how they're feeling and what they're telling you. Um, we can be really quick at redirecting them, particularly if they're going through some negative periods and negative emotions. So I think it's really important to listen to them, acknowledge them, um, understand where they're coming from. So you know, what, why it is they're thinking the way they are. Um, and then also sharing your own experiences and, and how you've encountered similar situations from your experience. And then you, you, once you get that connection with that player and that buy-in, I, I feel like it's an open book. They'll be more open with you. The communication gets better. You've got to create that safe environment for your players where they can come to you and be totally honest with you, almost to the point where they'll tell you stuff that they might not tell their parents. You know, mm -hmm. Just because it's trust on the court. And if they can trust you um, from a personal point of view, then they're going to trust you from a, a tennis point of view and anything you do based on, on their tennis. So I think that's really, really crucial. If you don't communicate, don't get to know your players, don't um, help them form their own identity, then, yeah, over the course of time, I think it just it fritters away and, and you lose that connection and they move on. We see that I've known you for a very long time and I know we talk tennis a lot, so it's great to see you just following through with that. And, you know, I wanted to speak to you a little bit about, you know, we've all been, we've all been coaches for a, a while now and we've spent time on the tour and day in, day out grind. Both of you could answer this, but mainly obviously for you, Mike, is where do you draw the boundary with your players? Some players love to just have your time constantly and don't really care about whether you've got a family or not or whether you have... Other things, uh, you know, you're trying to balance your day out as a coach. Some players are really like standoffish about it. So what do you, what do you feel? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I, I think you need to have some kind of boundary because the, yeah. the important thing is for you to be able to do the best job you can. You've got to also, and the player has to also understand that you need to do what's best for you to give them everything you've got. So whether that's having your own personal time when you're out on tour or, you know, family time in between tournaments. I think that's really, really important. But at the same time, you've got to make yourself available to the player. They're going to feel like they can go to you at, at, at any point of time. It's just communication. I think if you're honest with each other and you have that kind of relationship, and then your values have to match up as well. Uh, if, if one player is going one way and the coach wants to go another way, then, you know, you're going to have that tension on tour. Um, and this is part of the learning, like even I've gone through is different moments and how I would handle it differently. Um, 
where I thought, you know, this is best for me, but you've got to, there's got to be some um, to and fro and you've got to be able to find a common ground. Um, I just think it's communication. I think if you communicate better and you, the player has your trust, um, it's more likely to happen. But yeah, definitely need some boundaries because you need your own personal time as a coach to be able to give them whatever you need. I don't mean to interrupt. And I just wanted to ask, well, I do mean interrupt because I'm very good at that, but <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, um, we're on top of that same question is, that's fine when you've got one player. What about the coach that seems to coach maybe two or three players? And we've had this happen. You know, we've got three players, maybe two players. They've all started off at the same level, but then all of a sudden one gets a little more ahead of the other and you're time and heart is divided a little bit you don't know which way to go and it can get really difficult and awkward especially when you're traveling with those players have you guys had that stoney you've been coaching for a long time have you had that situation happen to you typically i try to not get into that i'm not a coach that really believes particularly at the top level that it works that well to divide your time between two players as players on the tour it's all about them and you're in a position of service. It's a selfless role as a coach. And I think you have to show that all about that player. I know particularly on the women's tour, there's not too many female players that want to share a coach. To what Mike said, I think working with those boundaries, you have to be upfront and clear with your expectations and what feels good to you at the beginning. It might be that you don't want any of the kids that you coach to follow you. You're not going to accept any a private friend requests on your social handles. If it's your business, it's a different thing. But that's something that's each to their own. We're not therapists, so we're not blurring a line like that, be, having that engagement. Essentially, they are our friends. But if you're a coach that wants to retain that bit of space, it doesn't mean that you don't care. You keep showing up for them in the, right. the way that you need to as a career. But you have to be careful that you're putting forward... A, I have a boundary after eight, I'll get back to you at eight in the morning on the weekends. That's my time. And it doesn't mean that has to be the conversation straight away, but if it comes up, you can share that with the family or, or whatever the case. What's your experience with that, Mike? Yeah, I totally agree with you. You've got to have those boundaries. For example, I don't add um, you know, any of my students other than, you know, the pro level players, but mm -hmm. any of my students, my personal um, accounts or anything like that, my work one, that's fine, but you've got to have that, that space and that, that freedom to be able to live your own life as well. Because again, as I said, players um, are people, we are people as well. We all have different likes and, and sometimes you and the player won't necessarily have the same interests. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. with each other 24 seven and you know, little things can start to annoy you, you, you sort of, you've still got to treat it as a work environment whilst you are traveling you're there primarily to work with the player on court, you know, off court, you can spend meals and, and do different things with them, but you also need your time to switch off. Otherwise you're, you're on for 24 hours and over a period of time, it just fatigues you. I mean, you guys will know, you know, as coaches, there's a lot of downtime in between even waiting for players as they do their physio, as they do their recovery, as they, so if you don't have that opportunity to even just go out for a coffee and, and, just free up your mind, you're, gonna, you're not going to stay fresh and you're not going to be able to last for too long on tour. So I think that's really, really important. Mike, in that fresh part, you're a guy that works super hard and it's amazing. You do a great job. How do you maintain your balance between your work and your private life so that things just don't go off course being such a dedicated coach and worker that you are? I probably haven't been great at it. Um, I've probably spent not giving myself enough time to do things I've wanted to do and just focus on the work aspect and, and probably, you know, and this is part of the learning as, as over a period of time, you realize, well, I can't keep going like this because I'm not going to be able to do this for too long. Correct. And then you know, being married also, you also need to give time to your, to your partner and make sure that everyone is getting what they need. So I think, again, it goes back to the boundaries you set at the start and the expectations that, okay, this is, how it's going to be. These is the expectations this is how we're going to work together. And then, you know, obviously as things progress, you can have different conversations, but I think it's really, really clear to make sure that you have those boundaries and that balance. I haven't been great at it in the past. I'm getting better. It's the ability to say no to people 
Mm -hmm. and, you know, young coaches, I think we want to be so available and want to do everything for everyone. And we overcompensate a little bit and then we forget about ourselves and we get, and I find one, the more you do that, um, the more they expect as well. And when you for just sure. take a time out and don't want to, you know, you just, I just need a break. I need a refresher a little bit, you know, that you can get a bit of tension sometimes. So I think it's really important that they understand that if you want the best from me, I need to be able to have that balance. Mike, one of our main roles as coaches is to fill the family in on what's happening and our biggest stakeholders are our parents in club land especially. How do you handle those conversations with parents when it comes to their child playing in tournaments, losing repetitively, sitting down with them? You have a disappointed, disgruntled parent. They're at your throat about the fact that they're spending so much money on private lessons and why aren't they winning and why aren't they getting better? I'd imagine we've all, we've all had those conversations before. How do you go about it? Yeah, we've all had those conversations. Um, I focus on the long-term always. So when I get a 10-year-old kid, I'm thinking, how do I want this 10-year-old to play when they're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22? Yeah. So I'll always ask them, what's the goal? So if the goal is, and most of them will tell you, I want to be top 100 pro, I want to win Grand Slams. Okay, if that's the goal, then that's what we're working towards. What happens in between is just development, is a development phase to get to where we need to get to. So in terms of results, I'm constantly emphasizing that message that it's not about the results. And I think if you're thinking about that, and a lot of it comes down to um, pressure from other kids, other parents, especially, I find the parents are more competitive than the kids. Yeah. Um, more yeah. comes from the parents yeah. than the actual kids. So then I start to wonder, okay, is this about what the parent wants or about what the kid wants. Mm -hmm. And usually it's probably more about what the parents seen. So now, again, when they talk about, you know, investing money into my child's tennis, well, yes, you're investing in their future. You're not investing in them being the best 10 and under 12 and under. And usually we know from the research, from experience that the best 10, 12 year olds are early maturers usually. And yeah. some of the, the better players develop a lot later. So you're looking for, you've got to know where you're at. And I think that's a big mistake that people make is they look too far ahead and they're not realistic with where they're at at that moment. And so the planning's not right. So you, I sort of give them an outline of, okay, this is what the journey is going to look like. This is why I'm doing this. And parents are really important. I think they're, and we talk about relationship building. I think parents are crucial to that. They are part of the team. You've got to keep them engaged. You've got to keep them on board. You've got to constantly update them as to what we're doing and why we're doing it and where it's going to lead to and, and constantly do that. So I'm the highs can't be high and the lows can't be low. You've just got to be committed, trust the process. And if at the end of the day, if, if a parent's not trusting the coach, they're going to look elsewhere. So I think as coaches, it's important that we're prepared to lose a student. We're okay with it, but we've got to stick to our guns and our values. And so for young coaches, I think it's really important that don't, you know, do what they want you to do just for the sake of a couple of results. You've got to stick to what you're going to do and stick to your values and stick to your processes and everything that you believe in because, you know, players come and go, you know, and you want people in your environment that are on board with you and allow you to go on that journey with them. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the different pressures that you feel young girls deal with versus young boys, Mike? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot. I think they, uh, they grow up a lot quicker. They're generally a lot more mature. Um, mm -hmm. And I find they're more, you know, someone told me this this week, uh, that they're more realistic about the journey and, and where they're going and what they want. It's yeah, not for sure. about it's yeah, not all about yeah. the tennis. It's, it's more about them as individuals is how they feel and finding their own identity. And I think a big problem is the identity is tied too much to the tennis. <laughs> and they're trying to find themselves as individuals, as young adults, as, as they progress. And especially when they go on tour, and I think it's really common that a lot of females especially take time away from the game. It's just too much. I need to find myself as a person. I need to just live a little and just experience different things. And then they come back and they realize, no, this is what I want to do. I don't think we've given them that opportunity to actually decide whether it's exactly what they want to do. And, and going back to what I said earlier, 
it's the stuff around the plane. The plane's easy, I find. It's the, it's, you know, when they get to that next level and they go and, and travel, it's different cultures, it's different, you know, diets, it's, it's dealing with different people. And you probably find that just probably in general in, in family dynamics that parents are more protective of the girls than the boys. Yeah, so definitely. Grown up that way. So I think it's important for us as coaches is when the kids are really young is that we're develop, helping them develop those, you know, I call them personal excellence skills, life skills, you know, adaptability, how to deal with different situations as well as the tennis. Because if yeah. we don't do that, you're going to encounter those problems later on. And I find that's really, really common. And I think, you know, as coaches, we probably don't spend enough time on that when they're young. Yeah, how, how do you go about that, Boo? How do you go about building those skills, those excellent skills that Michael's talking about? I think it's really like Michael said, it's so much easier to do when you are spending so much time with the player and building that relationship and trust. I think you can build that into a player over time. And I think the buy-in becomes a lot stronger over that period of time. I think it's trying to give as many facts, examples, truth, um, to it and I, I think once you get that and I think they get that external buy-in as well it, it just it just manifests itself into that path and I think it's all about relationships from my experience it's all been about relationships it's building that trust it's building that loyalty um, being honest I think is the number one key but the one thing I've experienced constantly with especially females is the constant comparison to other players you know very true why, why, I, I was winning. I'm no longer winning. She's doing this. She's doing that. She's got this coach. That coach is watching that player. Why aren't they watching me? You know, it's that we, we've all encountered that. And as a player myself, I can't sit here and, and lie about that. I've encountered that myself as a player. You know, why aren't they watching me? Why are they watching that player? Yeah. You know, you start to de de you know, downgrade yourself because you think you're not getting, your validation is a coach watching you play. And I think that can be the start of a really negative spiral effect mentally and I think that's the constant thing I feel we as coaches encounter a lot especially with that younger female mm. transition on the tour they're the conversations you're no longer talking about tactics you're sometimes talking about some petty stuff that yeah that, that comparison stuff. exactly so I don't know how you guys deal with that but I know in my experience it's chipping away at those things and, and talking about process Mike what you are it's getting back onto why we're we here why we're we doing this What's our next move rather than worrying about people that aren't in your circle? Mike, if yeah. you notice that with, with young female players and you can kind of see you've got groups of, you've got quite a few players that could get that comparison, that competitiveness. If you notice girls kind of dividing and that can be pretty dangerous to a training environment, yeah. what sort of things do you pick up on? Like what is the noticing? And then when you notice it, how do you deal with it? Yeah, it can happen. They get quiet a lot and they sort of steer away from the group. So we could all be standing together and one will tend to stay on the side or a mm. little bit quiet. They just won't talk. And it's not just the young girls, <laughs> you know, older players as well. Pro level players will do the same thing. You, you, you notice it straight away. And they, they, it's, it's usually a look um, that I notice. And so for me, what I try to teach, <laughs> it's you, we all know it, we all know it. What I try to teach them and all the students is that you're all in this together. You're not competing against each other. So if I've got a group of 12 year old girls, for example, if we work together, we're going to push each other. We're all going to get better together. We're competing against, you know, kids all over the world, you know, thousands of them who want to do exactly what you do. So if you start comparing to other, to other players at, at your age, you know, state level, then you're going away from what you're actually trying to do because they're all growing up differently. They're all at different individual levels. So there's no use comparing them. And the other thing, going back to what you said, Betty, I think when they start to think all those different things about, you know, so-and-so is watching that person. And I think it comes down to their identities tied up to their tennis. Solely, 100%. Not yeah. Them as individuals. So it's really important if, you know, if you get to 16 and, and you notice that as a coach, you start working with someone, Pretty much like I did when when I started with Zoe, is that it was yeah. too much tied into her tennis. That you got to work on that, and that might take time, but you've got to spend that time to allow her to grow into a young adult. And and it's taken a while for her and her journey, and there's been ups and downs. But 
when you go back to the young kids, I think it's really important to see them all individually and that you're on different journeys with different kids. And yeah. yes, there are commonalities and you've got your values and the way you teach and stuff, but you've also, you might deliver the message in different ways. You might be at different points of development where one may progress a little quicker than the other, but you've got to make that other person realize that that doesn't mean that that person's going to get to that level and you're not to. So it's, I think it's just constantly feeding them the information examples. Um, you know, and kids, kids are pretty good. They'll listen to coaches more so than say parents because mm -hmm. kids want to know who you are and what you've done. So if you've got that experience and you've worked and, and I'm not going to lie, it helps working with Zoe because I For can sure. go back to these younger girls and, and yeah. use them as an example. And you know, it's, it's almost like they see her as a, as a mentor to them as well. And, and what she's done, she's been on the same journey I have. So, you know, I understand it a lot better. And I think that's really important. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, Mike. And, uh, you know, the kids are very lucky to have you. And I think I say this every time I see you, uh, they all look so excited to come, you know, into the doors, gates open up at Parkdale. And generally when I've been there in the past, they're all thriving, they're all happy and you do a fantastic job. I just want you to share one uh, really fun fact with us, Mike, because recently I posted a photo of Steffi Graf and uh, I think it was 10 athletes that influenced our, our childhood. And I posted one up and you shared a pretty awesome story. Can you talk us through that, that story about Steffi Graf, you be, being a hitting partner, Steffi Graf, actually? Yeah, it was the 97 Australian Open. Um, I was still playing juniors. So it was, an, it was actually a busy time for me. I was playing juniors. I I got a wild card into men's quality. So there's so many things going on and I get a call um, asking if I wanted to hit with Steffi Graf the next day. And I'm like, well, is this for real? <laughs> you know, I'm on Rod Labor Arena hitting with Steffi. Um, and then they asked me to be her hitting partner for the tournament. And it was fantastic. And, and you know, at first I was a little nervous, a little in intimidated. I'm hitting with the number one player in the right. world. And I meet them at the hotel. I still remember it was a Como for breakfast and they were the nicest, you know, drove in with them to the, to the tennis center. We hit, um, yeah. And they worked around me, which I found incredible. This is the number one that player in the world working around my schedule. Like I was playing, you know, ITF junior tournament, leading tournament to the Aussie open. And they asked me, oh, when are you playing? Okay. Let us know when you're available for a hit and so on and so on. But yeah, it was, it was an incredible experience. I learned a lot of things that I still use today. Um, yep. just yeah like just she was very thorough and the session was always structured around how she wanted to play mm -hmm. so she you know every hit we'd go down the middle then we go cross court both ways and down the line both ways always yeah um, you know she'd work on her inside out forehand slice backhand was a big part moving me around so I did a bit of running with that I enjoyed <laughs> it because I love slice backhand yeah, so we're, up with we're, the slice, Mike. we're doing yeah, it was actually not bad. We were doing slice backhands, cross court, like for a while, and I was loving it. So I didn't mind. Didn't like it when it went to my forehand, but to the backhand. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was it was great. And yeah, and the only unfortunate thing was that was that tournament that she lost early in the round of sixteen. So a lot of players sort of looked at me. And, didn't uh, happen many times, it. Mike. No, it didn't happen. It just happened to be that one that I hit with her. So maybe your um, slice was just too good. Yeah, I think it was the kick serves. You didn't like the kick serves. <laughs> yeah, that must have been it. <laughs> really good experience. Mike, you've shared so much great information with us, so many takeaways, both for myself and Betty, but everyone who's listening. And we, we really sincerely value your time and appreciate you. I want you to close out with telling us, why does Michael Legazzo coach? I coach because, one, I love the game. And two, like, I have a, a passion for developing people and players. And my goal is to develop the next champions, you know, in Australian tennis. That, that's my goal. That's why I coach. Whether, you know, they're not all going to achieve that, that level. But, you know, each and every person that comes into our program, I would hope that we give them the best possible coaching we can. And, and let them dream big and, and let them decide what they want to do. Not up to me to decide, but them and, and at least give them that opportunity love it love it mike All right. love that message and sarah um just to close this out i first of all want to close it out by acknowledging the fantastic nine women that made the wta happen and you're wearing a jacket to commemorate that so what year is that jacket by the way 
1912. No. <laughs> I was this big. Talk about developing early when I was 13 on the Junior Fed Cup team, and it still fits me. My other jacket from the 16s, Junior Fed Cup, I actually switched jackets with Andy Roddick. So I've got an American one back in America, and, and I don't have that one. But I've got this little piece of piece of Oz. So that's uh, fun to remember the old times and just have that as a piece of you, the original nine for women and, and women in tennis and what Billie Jean led and Gladys Heldman and all, the whole crew, Judy Dalton. It was unreal. And guys like Mike being on board really behind women makes such a difference for us growing the women's game. So we really appreciate you. And thanks for being a, a male who leads an advocate for women and look forward to keeping working together. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. Thanks, Mike.